So what happens when four stars leave the bright lights of Broadway and take leading roles in a small town controversy making national headlines? Big drama, bigger laughs, and honestly, one of the best musicals I've ever seen. Um, trust me, you will love it when you see it. Uh, let's start off with a little video. I don't want to start a riot. I don't want to blaze a trail. I don't want to be a symbol or cautionary tale. I don't want to be a scapegoat for people to oppose. What I want is simple as far as wanting goes. I just want to dance with you, let the whole world melt away and dance with you. Who cares what other people say? And when we're through, no one can convince us we were wrong. All it takes is you and me. And a song. I don't need a big production, streamers hanging in the air. I don't need to spend the night with confetti in my hair. I don't need a room of people that I don't really know. I just want to hold you and never let you go. I just want to dance with you, let the whole world melt away and dance with you, who cares what other people say, and when we're through, no one can convince us we were wrong, all it takes is you and me, and a song. away and dance with you who cares what other people say and when we're through no one can convince us we were wrong all it takes is you and me Thank you. That was so great. Uh, have a seat. Uh, so that was one of the great numbers in the musical. And I'd like to invite the rest of the cast to join us uh, so we can start asking them some questions about the show. Hi. Hi. 
Hey, everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's it, this is a really awesome panel. I'm so excited to have all of you here. Um, I'm going to hop right in because I know that we all have tons of questions. Um, four Broadway stars, hungry for attention, have had some bad publicity. Um, they decide to go and help a teenage lesbian who has been told that she can't go to the prom with her date. Um, and they say, we can fix this. Honestly, when I saw that, I thought it was maybe a hard sell. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm gay. Would I go see this? And then I saw it, and I was like, this is amazing, honestly. Uh, I want to start first with the, the kind of the, the, the process by which you all got attached to this, because I imagine I'm not the only person that was like, hmm, interesting concept. How did you all get involved? Uh, the money. Casey Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Casey Nicola, uh, who is the director choreographer of the show. Uh, we've all worked with him many times, uh, or only on this, but uh, he pretty much got in touch with us and wanted us to be a part of it, uh, which is very lucky and fortunate for all of us. And we've all been involved with it for a long time. We've been we're working on this for a considerable amount of time. And uh, all of it joyous and fantastic. So it was, it was an easy audition process, honestly. <laughs> um, so uh, another question quick first. Um, yeah. Oh. I'm gonna edit that out, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Oh, if you can look, also give me, uh, let, let us know your names and like what part you play in the, in the show. Um, uh, my hello? Hello. Oh, hello, hello. My name is Christopher Sieber. I play a uh, out of work and former member of Actors' Equity Association. Uh, <laughs> Trent Oliver, who is a uh, uh, former actor, try, still trying to be, and now he's a cater waiter. Uh, I'm Brooks Ashmanskis, and I play Barry Glickman, who is a... a Broadway veteran, uh, an old uh, gay actor. <laughs> so real stretch. <clears throat> Stick with me. <laughs> um, I'm Isabel McCalla. I play Alyssa Green, uh, the closeted girlfriend of Emma, who's just trying really hard <laughs> to come out but can't. I play, uh, I'm Caitlin Kinnon, and I play Emma Nolan in the show, who is the teenage lesbian. I'm Michael Potts, and I play uh, Tom Hawkins, who is the principal of the school. Hi, Angie Schwar. I play Angie, um, <laughs> a old chorus girl with the heart of gold. <laughs> Hi, I'm Courtney Collins, and I play Mrs. Green. She does not have a first name. Mrs., um, who is the, uh, the president of the PTA in Indiana, and I'm also Izzy's mother, and I'm trying to keep her in the can. Uh, oh, I've got one. Got one. Uh, I'm Chad Beglin. I co-wrote the book, which is the script, and uh, I wrote the lyrics to the songs. Uh, I'm Matthew Sklar. I wrote the music. That's it? That's it. That's all I did. <laughs> I'm Beth Level. I play diva Dee Dee Allen, who has won two Tony Awards that she carries with her at all times. <laughs> they make a cameo. It's really great. Uh, so uh, Matthew and Chad, specifically, um, how do you approach uh, an original work like this? Um, some of your previous work is really awesome, but they're, they're based on properties that exist already. How did you formulate this show? Well, there was a lot of trial and error. Um, the idea came from Jack Bertel, and uh, he was working with our director, Casey, and he said, I have this idea for a show, and you know, thankfully he suggested us to write it. And uh, we got together with Casey and uh, Bob Martin, who's not here today, but uh, co-wrote the script with me, and there was just a lot of brainstorming. And you know, we did a million workshops and a million readings, and uh, you know, the show used to, a, a very early version of the show opened with, uh, these three characters all in different horrible musicals. So Beth yeah. was in Tell them which yeah. Beth was in Goonies, Goonies the musical, musical. Um, uh, Forrest Gump the musical. the musical, and Long Day's Journey into Night the, the musical. musical. 
<laughs> and they all they all ended with confetti cannons. Yes. E even Journey, which so was just at the top of the show, we just, just blasted the audience with confetti. And just everybody in in Long Day's Night go Journey and then confetti. Yeah. We thought um, it was hilarious. That's, a, that's another musical. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's but uh, yeah, but uh, so it was a lot of stuff like that. We'd try it and we'd go, okay, well that doesn't work. Or, you know, it it was a lot of uh, you know, yeah. just, and and definitely with this caliber of a cast, you know, getting their input and and it has been crucial. So it's it was great to sort of design these roles for these actors. Yeah, it we when we first started, we just spent we spent a couple of years outlining and just trying to figure out where songs would go and how they would function. And we, we were probably at it for two years before we even kind of invited you guys into the process. We, are, we had you all in mind for it. Um, and, uh, but but it was a, it, it was a, it's a really lengthy process from, from the idea to opening on Broadway was about eight years, really long time. Um, and the, the one character that changed the most um, we used to have, uh, instead of Angie's character, we had, um, I forget what her name was, but she was an understudy to Elphaba, and she, was, she never got to go on, she was always slightly green. And, 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 and but, get but, the makeup off. Yeah, she couldn't get the makeup off. She was allergic to it or something, but it, and we thought it was kind of campy, and then we were, we were meeting one day, and Casey said, what if it's like a, a showgirl, like, like, like Angie? And we said, yeah, like Angie. So we just wrote it for Angie. <laughs> Which I love. Glad it was Roxy Hart, not <laughs> Alphaba. It, it was the right move. It was the right move. Uh, so that that awesome. <laughs> I'm glad that you didn't have to. Uh, I hear it's not easy. Um, exactly. Hey, oh. Couldn't help myself. Uh, but speaking of Casey, you know, he directs and he choreographs, which is, for those of you who aren't musical theater fans, that's a big deal, and, and that's a, a different style of direction and choreography. How is it working with a director choreographer versus, you know, the directing and the choreography separate? Is does that really change it for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's. I think it becomes just much more focused. Everything that happens in the show is is basically coming from the not just the mind of the writers but then when it's filtered through one person as opposed to two musicals are very very collaborative events uh, i think the most collaborative art form there is and so that can be uh an opportunity but it can also be a challenge and so that's one less challenge taken away so you just have one person instead of two it automatically becomes such a cohesive piece mm -hmm. instead of like bits and pieces trying to work together it's just streamlined and I also think it makes it seamless yeah because yes there's choreography but when you have someone with the same vocabulary it just is seamless and you can't really tell where one in and one begins it's the same language and that's Casey's so brilliant with that so it makes makes our job easier and I, I'm thinking of very specific points in the in the plot where where you have basically two scenes happening at once right. where there's dancing and there's acting and that's that's it's pretty amazing. That actually was really more challenging. That was actually more challenging because uh, we we were trying to make that work, and the audience wasn't getting it. But we we were able to. Uh, well, Casey was able to to fine tune it, and it was clearly in different places, but we're still in the same room. Uh, that was brilliantly done by Casey Nicola. Yeah. yeah, I I and I noticed it, and I said, "This is this is smart." Um, speaking of smart, um, thank you, <laughs> all of you. Um, Unruly Heart, specifically. Um, it's a song you sing in the second act. It is such a great song um, for Emma, um, but it's written by Emma. And writing a song that feels authentically written by a teenager when you're not, um, I, if hey, I can assume. Come on. Yeah. You, you seem like you're maybe in your early 20s, yeah, no, that, but I'll we're go not ageist here. <laughs> Everyone here is in their early 20s. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but how did you go about writing that piece specifically? Well, that song was music first. Um, it had that tune living in me for actually a long time, and I didn't know what to use it for. And when this uh, moment came up in the plot, and it took years to figure out, you know, what that moment was going to be when Emma kind of, you know, you know, comes into her own, um, it felt like, oh, I can use this tune. And then Chad, uh, I, I, you know, sent a, a recording of it to Chad, and and he wrote this beautiful lyric, 
and uh, and it's it's morphed over the years. It used to really just be Emma, and then we added the kids to it, and then in our last workshop, which was just in in January, in January February, um, uh, Casey said, "I just I want the kids to just soar more." So I, I and and. Uh, he was really on me about that because we used to end it very quietly and it, and it worked in Atlanta in our out of town a couple years ago. But um, he said, I think we can get more out of it. And so went downstairs and took three shots at it. And then the third, he was like, that's it. And then we taught it to everybody and everybody was a crying mess. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's a crying mess every single it day. It feels like that, yeah. In, in the me audience included. as well. Me yeah. included, Definitely. yeah. Everyone is There's a always like a pause before people start clapping that you just hear the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> every night. Wear, wear long sleeves. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of crying messes, um, for those of you who were watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade um, from home, not when it was 20 degrees. First of all, wow. Hello. Yeah. God bless you guys. Um, yeah. Good work. It was seven degrees. Oh. It was. And uh, it was also the first LGBT kiss at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade about damn time. Good work. Uh, so it's, it's been a week, uh, and there has been buzz about that. How have you all received that? I mean, don't read the comments, but how, how have you received that? It's been funny to hear uh, uh, from uh, the uh, people opposing any like good goodness, love and light, um, uh, the comments that they're making about uh, two people who just happen to love each other kissing on a national television. And they thought, you know, the, our children's innocence is broken. And we, the funny thing, reading comments like that, you kind of go, well, all right, you kind of just missed the entire point of the entire thing. But also um, seeing everybody from around the world defending, mm -hmm. it, it was it was like your heart just got bigger and bigger because there were more people jumping on those haters than anything I've ever seen defending and, and making points about, you know, gun control and all these other things, which were very, quite valid. But um, it was so nice to see so many people, just the message of love that we have, uh, holding on to that and, and preaching that out rather than any any kind of hate. And um, for me, what was the most rewarding was that I kept getting messages from teenagers across the country. Yeah, all of us. Writing, all of us. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we all did about how either they were still in the closet, just had recently come out, identify as bi, identify as gay, and how it made them feel validated and just human. To be like, that is, that, there are so many families that look like that around the world. And to say it's not a family show is actually not true because there are so many families like that. And hearing those kids feel inspired by it and feel emboldened to be themselves was kind of the best um, result of it. That's uh, that's really awesome to hear because sometimes it goes the opposite direction. And it's like, wow, maybe we overstepped. Um, but uh, queer representation and representation in general has become a bigger and bigger thing in Broadway, bigger and bigger thing in movies. Um, Head Over Heels has a trans character played by a trans actor. Uh, the Donna Summer musical has an almost entirely uh, female cast, and various uh, musicals are using sign language interpreters and sign language as part of the show. Um, writing a show that is kind of, I don't want to say pushing an agenda, but pushing an agenda is also hard. Um, what, for those of you who maybe are more veteran in the industry, um, not that you're not. The you're olds. You can call us the olds. The um, olds. Speak up, boy. What? <laughs> who? Where am I? So for those of you yes. who have been here for a while, yes. um, uh, how, has, how has acting and performing changed over the time um, that you've been here? I know you actually came out in the process of, of your career, yeah. um, Christopher, and do you feel like that would be different now? Like, do people well, even have to? Anymore? What happened was I was I was always gay, you know. I was always, and everybody knew. So coming out was like and. Um, but uh, you know, I did my my very first um, situational comedy on ABC called Two of a Kind, where I played the Olsen's dad, and they uh, the uh, thank you, thank it you, also, thank ah. you, thank you so much. No, it, go on. It also gets a cameo in the <laughs> yeah, show. Yes. Um, so, but I I, I played uh, Professor Kevin Burke. I had two two daughters, and and. Uh, 
uh, they wanted to, our executive producer said, uh, uh, hey, do you want us to fly your wife out? And I said, oh. Uh, well, let, let's let's go talk in your office. So I said, you know, my, I don't have a wife. I have a, a partner, and and they were like, oh yeah, great. I don't know how to deal with this. I mean, it's Hollywood. It's different, you know. Theater is like whatever, but um, television, you know, there's so many closeted people still. But um, I said, I don't know how to handle this. I don't care. But I, you know, it's it's about the show. It's not about me. So it's like they were like, if you make a big deal out of it, it'll be a big deal. If you don't, it won't. So that's what we did. Um, but then the second sitcom was It's All Relative, where John Benjamin Hickey and I played partners, well-heeled uh, um, uh, men with a daughter in, in at Harvard. Um, we kind of just said, well, yeah. I mean, we're two gay actors playing gay men. Let's. Let's go out and say, hi, everybody, yeah. And again, it was kind of like, eh, whatever. You know, it was like, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know. So it wasn't a problem. Uh, now, though, I mean, over the course of the years, you know, you see these, these, like Izzy was saying, you see kids at our stage door wanting autographs, and there are tears in their eyes because they see themselves finally represented. And they are so moved, and they're shaking with tears uh, just from seeing the show. Um, you know, I am here. I am here. And then that's what, that's what I see when, like, somebody saw me, finally. So, uh, but th then they're coming out younger and younger, which is so great, which is fantastic, because, um, um, you know, there's a lot of people that just have the courage enough to be themselves. Yeah. Uh, that's wow, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, I would also say that the... Brooks you know, is gay, too. Uh, Brooks no, is gay. No, no, God, no. I like the ladies. <laughs> we don't... Uh, you know, you said someone else, but that you know that this is pushing an agenda, and I would deeply disagree with you on that. Mm. And not in a mean way, just to say what, what the theater does is presents, a, a, you know, a, as a mirror to life, right? And so... Agendas are attached to things or pl tagged onto things, and 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 some of them are welcome. You know, obviously, the, the, all the good news about love is love and all of that stuff is a welcome agenda that can be tagged onto this. There are unwelcome ones as well, as we were talking about about the Macy's thing with some people not really loving that. And you know what? <sighs> okay, but the th what's so beautiful about this show in particular, and why I bring this up, is that it doesn't judge mm. or it sends up judgment sends up our leftist mm -hmm. judgments mm -hmm. about small town america and vice versa and and it lets the audience you know have their own agenda about it or not but hopefully just to give them just a little taste of light you know that's what this show does beautifully and it's funny yeah. And it's funny. I just have to say that it is one of the best musicals in my 94 years in show business. <laughs> it is one of the most satisfying pieces of theater, if not, I, I will say it. It is the greatest show I've ever done. Me too. Me too. It really is. And I think it's crafted so beautifully. What you guys have written is, I think, oh my gosh, it's just the greatest. Wait until you hear these tunes wrapped up in his whole story about love, listening, tolerance, entertainment. People have, and I'm told this constantly, have never laughed so hard at a musical in their life. And then at the end go, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm crying out of joy. I mean, the joy that comes from this show is unbelievable. And the audience at the end, every single show, is, we have a standing, I feel like we're celebrating with the audience the joyous collaboration that we have all just experienced. And that is why I'm in theater. Thank you. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I appreciate that. That, that, is, that is a really great correction because I... I um, I have another question specifically for you because you play Mrs. Green without a first name. Um, and I noticed that, you know, she doesn't get a redemption. She gets a we'll talk later. And, and that was really honest. And it wasn't, it, it didn't answer the question to, to your mind. It, it, didn't, it, it didn't solve the problem. But 
it shows that everybody is a little bit of an outsider in, in the show. Everyone is bringing something that, that's a little outside of the norm in some way. How, now you're also from Atlanta, right? Yes. Yes. You're not from New York. Nope. You're dealing in your day-to-day -day life in Atlanta with people that are probably not all New York liberal types. And you know these characters. You know this person, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah. how, how is the process of being in that character here? Now, I'm not going to presume anything about your, your political bent or anything like that. Right. But I'm curious, how do you build that character? Well, as a Republican, no, I'm joking. <laughs> No, um, so <laughs> no, that's not true, actually. But um, it, the character has uh, grown on me, <laughs> and on all of us, I think. Um, the character has morphed and changed, and, and these incredible uh, writers uh, have, have really added a lot of depth mm -hmm. and um, layers to Mrs. Green that maybe wasn't in the first reading that I read two years ago in Atlanta. Um, and I think what, what I've noticed is that we've taken all, basically a lot of political references out of the, out of the play. Um, it's very sort of um, party neutral, I would say, um, from, from Mrs. Green's side. Um, so I always say that wherever you are, because I mean, we're, we're playing to New York audiences, but we're also playing to middle America. We're playing to people who come to the show from everywhere. So I think that wherever people sit in the audience and from whatever side of politics they sit on, they're gonna see themselves, they're gonna laugh at themselves, they're gonna notice, maybe learn something about themselves. Um, I, I think it's a very, we, we celebrate everybody, we open our hearts to everybody, and we represent um, small town America and um, in, in a very truthful manner um, about people who are afraid of big government and we're afraid of people who are different from us. And, and in the end, um, and the same with the New Yorkers. The New Yorkers come and they're, you know, they're so sure that their way of, of tolerance in life is, is uh, they're going to teach us compassion, these booger-eating whatever y'all say about the... <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that. <laughs> That's new. Cousin, That's cousin humping, <laughs> booger-eating, <laughs> spam eating. That's spam eating, sorry. <laughs> You'd tell us if you had a stroke, right? <laughs> I would be the last to know. <laughs> but, but this is the, my favorite part about playing Mrs. Green is, besides the fact that she does not have a first name, <laughs> is that um, I have had so many stories shared with me from gay men and women about, uh, because it doesn't resolve, because the uh, Chad and Bob and Matt have, have tried very very hard to find a truthful story about a child who is gay and a mother who doesn't want the child to be gay. Um, and the dialogue that happens between um, parents and kids um, being who they are and the parent not wanting that, you know, person is afraid, the fear, the fear of, of, of your child um, not being like you and the fear of your child not having an easy life. That's what they perceive. So the dialogue that happened, people have come up to me and shared their beautiful stories about um, their, their um, conversations with their parents that are very similar to the conversations that we have in the show and the things that Mrs. Green says to her daughter. Um, and some of the stories end happily, most of them don't. Mm -hmm. And um, I carry those stories with me every night in this play. So that's been a beautiful sort of result of, of playing this. And uh, I wanna give you a tiny little gift um, I was hanging out with some friends from Austin, Texas that had come to the show with their extended family, some of whom are a little more on the, on the conservative end. And I said, oh, I'm going to interview the cast. And one of them said, oh, so my stepfather came out of the show and said, there's some things I need to rethink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, you you're... <laughs> You're doing really solid work, all of you. So, you know, from the community, thank you. Um, I mean, we, 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 
I know it's a musical and we talk about music, but I also wanted to to thank the creative team because they've taken such great care of the book as well. They've mm. put in the same amount of compassion. Book scenes in a musical, mostly mostly in musicals, the book scenes get tossed. No one really cares, like get to the next dance or, or, or the next song. But they have taken such great care of the characters and of the story that they want to tell, even outside of the music. And I wanted to thank you for that. That's thank pretty you. incredible and rewarding. Yeah, Bob, thank you too. From, from Canada. Uh, we've got some questions from the audience, and I would love to, uh, to open up uh, now for some of those. Uh, hi, I've got a question for the writer. Um, I'm a hobbyist writer, and I was wondering if you could give any advice to what kind of pitfalls you kind of fell into and, and what you would do differently to make it be like maybe not eight years, but something shorter. <laughs> um, uh, time travel. Um, the, uh, I think the best advice I ever got was that it's got to be bad before it can be good. And so when you write that first song, you write that first draft, the first scene, and then you go back and you're like, oh, this is awful. Um, that's part of the process. And it's so easy to just give up and just say, OK, well, this is not working where it's really about rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And I think um, another thing that actually my therapist said to me a long time ago, um, you know, I would get sort of a panic, especially with lyrics, when we needed a new lyric, the sort of panic of like, oh, can I do it? Can I do it? And she said, it sounds like you're closing down when you should be opening up. And I thought, whoa, OK, that's a really good way to look at it. Um, so I think that's the other thing is that, you know, it's because there's so much pressure uh, that, uh, you know, to, to sort of trust the process and trust the collaborators and, and you know, know that it will come. <laughs> uh, yes. So I saw some clips of the Atlanta production online, which is how I first found out about and fell in love with the show. Um, and I noticed a few like artistic and structural changes from that one to this production, particularly like with the song You Happened and a few other things. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the rewriting process and what you had in mind, whether it was feedback from audiences or changing geography or anything. Well, with You Happened, uh, it, in Atlanta, it was basically just a duet for Emma and Alyssa. And what we found was that it wasn't propelling anything forward. Um, and then actually our, our producers, um, Dory, who's back there actually, um, told us about the phenomenon of uh, promposals that were happening in, in, in high schools across America. And uh, we thought maybe we can get some straight promposals happen in that song. And then we're gonna join Emma and Alyssa, you know, where they are, you know, talking about the prom, but in private. So we're going from this big celebration to these girls who, who have to hide you know, their love for each other. Um, and that's kind of the, how we started with this new version of the song. And we just feel like it's just more, um, and, and we get to see them be happy. You know, we think in Atlanta, the two girls, it was a lot of angst a lot of the time. And we realized that we really wanna see them be happy in act one. Um, so that was one of the big uh, reasons for that, that change as well. And we also, uh, another big thing we focused on was the uh, town itself and making that more real. Yes. Um, and I'm actually from a small town in southern Illinois, and the, the, all of the stuff Mr. Hawkins says is actually true of my hometown. We had a factory shut down. The prison's the only place, you know, it's the only place that employs anybody, and it's hard to even get a job there. I mean, it's really putting that sort of reality into the show, I think, has helped it. Ground it. Yeah, when, when we left Atlanta, Casey said, I want the, here's one of, one of the big things I want to work on. I want to make sure we're not Broadway people going to a Broadway town. I want Broadway people to go to a real town. And that was really the, the bulk of our work from Atlanta to New York. And I think it made a huge difference. It feels really real. It almost feels like there's kind of three shows happening. There's the town show, there's the Broadway folks show, and then there's the love story. It really... And you need all of them to balance yeah. each other out. And they're very distinct. It's awesome. The, the work... The yeah. And the intelligence of Mrs. Green. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Because you don't want to show these people stupid. No, we never, never want to... We're not villainizing anybody. Right. We're all real people. And that was really important. Awesome. Thank you. Another question? Hi there. 
So I have two questions about energy. So I, I saw the show with my mom on October 29th, which was this preview during Monday, and there were a bunch of other performers there. So I felt like the energy was oh, extra right, right, right. high during that yes. night, and I had yes. never seen anything like that. It was super fun. <laughs> Um, and so I'm just wondering, this is actually a question for my mom, and then I have a separate question for myself. Um, so hi, mom, when you see this hi, mom. on YouTube. Um, hi, mom. So my mom's question was, how do you keep the energy up when you're performing the same show and sometimes two times a day? And then my question is, um, during preview versus officialness, how do you, um, like, I know you can't make changes after the preview period ends, but... How do you sustain that, and um, do you try harder during previews, or do you try harder after? Or, like, how do you try? <laughs> try harder, all the good questions. Brooks? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, well, um, during the preview process, you're, we're still rehearsing during the day, um, upwards of like, five, I think it's four or five hours. Yeah. Yeah. Four or five hours uh, <laughs> before that night's show in previews. And during that process, during those four or five hours, we are making changes. Uh, we are lucky, though, because we, we have all done so much work on this. There wasn't that much, but there was a lot. Uh, because there's just little details. Storytelling was like the biggest tightening thing we did during the preview section. But it's it's a long and hard, tedious process to put on a big, huge Broadway show. There's a lot of tech elements. There's uh, the costumes, the wigs, the makeup, the sound, uh, orchestra, everything. And it's all coming together in one big room. And to get everyone together and and synchronize, like, like watches almost, finally getting together, it does take a toll on your brain. Because there's so much new stuff that's and stuff that we've we've had been doing for six years, and all of a sudden just like my two numbers, uh, love thy neighbor and acceptance, they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna change everything you've known for the last six years, and um, that that happens, and your brain is like, I don't even know what I'm saying, and then that night I said some weird line, but didn't matter. I think I went bow 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 bow. Yeah, yeah that did. was the lyric that night because I don't remember what it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it takes so 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 there's you, yes you're wiped out you're absolutely wiped out like mentally physically vocally and you get on stage and I, I always call it doctor show some people call it doctor grease paint doctor theater you you get on stage and for some reason there's something within us that we become superheroes on stage. It's weird. I mean, if you have a cough, you won't have a cough on stage. If you have hiccups backstage, you won't have them on stage. If you're sneezing like that, you will not have them on stage. It's the most bizarre thing. Um, but but yeah, so we're tired. But that's that's just what happens. And I also think there's something really uniquely special about this show because we've all been working on it for so long and we're all friends with each other in real life and we all want to be telling this story and so when we get on stage with each other there's like this instant bond and this instant like okay we're gonna do this yes we're exhausted yes we've been doing this forever and we're tired and we would like to be in our beds but like we all get on stage and we just you turn it on and it's easy with these people because we want to be there and we want to be telling this story and that makes a huge difference so no it's hard the audience from the night that you were there, it was, I mean, it, we must have added 10 minutes to the show with laughs. But our performances didn't change from that night until the end of last week when we had done eight shows in a row and the Macy's Thanksgiving parade in minus 40 degrees. So, you know, because we, A, were professionals, B, that's my job. And there are 20 million other people going, let, I'll do it if she can't. So, Big motivator. Yeah, it is a bad one. Big motivator. <laughs> but I'm so proud of the show that all of us give 150% every single show. And thank you for coming. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> it's also the audience. I'm sorry. Yes. But, you know, it, that's why we love to do this, you know, and not other things that can be taped or things like that. It's this that, uh, for me personally, I know it of these other people as well, that's what gives me the energy. I have no energy right this second. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, I'm asleep. Uh, because it's, you know, it's not even what, two yet? This is ridiculously early, 149 and 53 seconds. Google, uh, but it's, it really is the audience. If the audience is not there with us, 
it, that becomes very difficult. But this show so far, it's been, you know, a real treat because people seem to really climb on board and happily. I'm so glad about that. So it's, th so it's thanks to you. All right, so we've got time for one more quick question and then we've got, we've got a couple more performances, so stick around. Thanks, everybody. Um, I saw the show the Sunday of the opening weekend, and it was a really great performance. I really enjoyed it. Uh, kind of have another specific question for the composer. Um, spoiler alert, there's a really great number during the prom um, that you really wrote kind of this great blend of, you know, a Broadway dance number that's mixed with an EDM, you know, top 10 sounding number. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced in sort of making a sound that really encompassed both of those? Well, um the, the show is really lives in two musical worlds. We have the Broadway sound and then we have the kid sound. Um, and, uh, you know, I, what I had to do is really simplify harmonically and, uh, and lyrically. We had to kind of simplify things for the kids. And, um, you know, part of it is, you know, usually make my own demos when we're writing stuff. And then we get to give our work to these brilliant arrangers and orchestrators. Um, and give them direction. So, you know, I have to give credit to them for helping make those sound, you know, those, those songs sound so authentic. Um, and that really, uh, but I think most of it is, you know, listening to what, you know, what people are, are listening to now and dancing to. And, and it was also a challenge to write in that particular song because it lives in Brooks world and then we morph, and then you thump, 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 thump. It's the same tune, um, but uh, but it's sort of flattened out, and it's no. This, we don't swing the eighth notes anymore, and then it becomes a dance, a dance tune. So, um, part of it is a, a lot of it is arrangement, um, and then but in the construction of it, just making sure that you have a melody and chords. A structure that can live in both worlds. And I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you <laughs> That's basically it. Great. Just a lot of listening. A lot of listening. So uh, we. Sorry. Ele electronic, electronic dance, dance music. music. <laughs> That's what the kids are talking about. Yeah. I was like, erectile <laughs> dysfunction <laughs> man. <laughs> I think that's a different musical. Go back to sleep, Brooks. Thanks. Go back to sleep. I'm here. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, you are. And uh, you, you have a mic in your hand, and we have a couple of more songs that we're going to hear from the cast. Uh, we have uh, one from uh, Brooks and one from Beth. Uh, the Prom is an excellent musical. I want everyone to go Thank see it. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks for having us, Google. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Just so you know what's going on. Um, this song is called The Ladies Improving, and Beth's character, it was the song that she sang many, well, not many. Yes, it was, like um, 20 years Okay, ago. a long time ago. And uh, it made her a star. And so the principal, Mr. Hawkins, is a big, huge fan of her, and he keeps begging her to sing the song. Um, she, when he finds out that she's just there to use them for publicity, he's furious at her, so to make it up to him, she performs a song in his office. You're welcome. <laughs> Standards feel free to give notes. There isn't an issue, and that's why I wish you could see. There's no reason to fret. So I'm begging you, sir, don't give up on her yet. Everybody thinks that I've got some kinks that I'll never. 
never work out Even you're inclined to think I'm unrefined But I promise with some time That my aptitude will climb And you'll leave your doubts and disbeliefs behind The lady's improving, removing all doubts yeah, she has hidden charms that are sure to come out. You're bound to discover that this book's not her cover. So don't make a move you'll regret. So I'm begging you, sir, no reneging on her. And so for this final song, Barry uh, reveals earlier in the show that he never went to the prom because he, you know, he was too afraid and didn't have the courage that Emma has. And uh, she, once, I, mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, once it seems like the prom is back on, uh, Emma goes to Barry's hotel room and says she wants him to be her date for the prom. And she leaves and he sings this song. Brooks <laughs> Ashman. Thank you. Hit it. <clears throat> I'm oddly excited. Perhaps that's because, although it shouldn't matter, it somehow does. It's strange, but I feel like I'm in a time machine. Cause guess what? It's like I'm suddenly 17. So book a white limo, uncork the dom. After 29 years, I am finally going to rock. I once thought a night like this wasn't in the cards. Now I've got a date, a tux, and the whole nine yards. A rational person would just stay calm. Oh, since when am I rational? Barry is going to pop the prom. I wish I could tell that sad kid I was to stop crying into his Cheetos. They say it gets better. Guess what it does? Who cares if you're a big old girl? Just get into that gym and twirl. Barry's going to the, to the friggin' prom. Oh. Oh. I'm okay. In showbiz, I never felt such a thrill divine. My date is a high school lesbian. Still, it's fine. And though it's been years, I might call my mom and tell her that though it's overdue, all of my waiting is over too. And if you're not happy, I'm over you. Cause Barry. Yes, Barry. Mom, Barry's going to pro. Thank you. One more time, give it up for the entire cast. No, sorry, the leading cast of the prom, the musical. Thank you so much, everyone.